Yes, it is. <laughs> black, you know, downtown. No, you gotta, you gotta well, I lived in Chicago. I found out why people dress black all the time. Because the, the city drives it like all over the place. White is not black. But black isn't necessarily. I said you end up with crud visible everywhere. Yeah, but it's better. I did. One of my friends carried over a, a spare pie he had. I didn't get pumpkin pie on Thanksgiving. Oh, so I man. Was very sad. That's an American. Friday came and so I still she, had no pumpkin pie. So she went on Facebook. And I complained about my lack of pumpkin pie.
said pecan, if you said warm pecan with vanilla ice cream on top, I'm there. I want to see someone make a good pecan. <laughs> All of the ones I've had lately are just so evil. <laughs> oh, man. If, if you like pecans, um, Cerberus does a caramel pecan red pudding. It is amazing. With the homemade caramel ice cream on top. Oh, yeah. I like I like good food. But the problem with the problem with being a foodie and cooking, you know, that way and all that, my daughter is the same way. She's in business. But the problem is it's a one way street. You cannot go back. Once you've had really good anything. steak, anything it becomes really challenging yes, to accept yes. second par stuff. That's right. You, it's very difficult to go backwards. Yes, I worked for um, the Villa, which is an Italian restaurant in Palmer Lake, back when it was a four-star restaurant. And getting, like, as an early, it's like 15 to 17, and learning that that's how you cook and what you cook with, and then going into my college years was a really unpleasant shock. Yeah. I was like, I don't have heavy cream? What do you mean it's not on hand? Oh yeah, it's like eggnog. I find people, people when I mention eggnog, I, I make a thing during the season now that it's called death by eggnog, right? Mm -hmm. But it's real eggnog. I mean, yeah. if you put this stuff in the freezer, it turns to ice cream. Mm -hmm. But people who have only had out of the carton eggnog with that little chemical taste to it, you know, that preserves it, this stuff has to be consumed within 24 hours because it's raw it. eggs, right? So, but it's raw eggs and it's half heavy whipping cream and half whole milk and have to four cups of sugar. With you oh, I've got a whole cookbook. So I can make it for my husband. Oh, I've got a whole no. cookbook. How is that different than moose milk? Moose milk? Never heard of it. The Canadian, it's a Canadian dairy-based mm -hmm. beverage that well, I think the, the stands big, up to alcohol. Yeah, the big the big thing is that, first of all, I don't ever put alcohol in mine. I, you know, oh, I don't okay. like it with alcohol in it. I've never it's found victory. any... I don't care what you put in it. I've never found anything that goes good in it. Maybe Bailey's if you put a little bit in it, but no, the, the thing is heavy whipping cream, not half and half, yeah. not, you know, table cream, heavy whipping cream. Why does cream. anyone ever call for half and half? I'm like, just I know. use heavy cream yes. or regular milk. Or forget it. Or it's like milk. putting heavy cream on your oatmeal. Oh, you know, it's such a difference in milk. But anyway. <laughs> Yeah, the it's, two dozen, no, I know. No, I it's know. two dozen eggs, uh, half a gallon of heavy whipping cream, half a gallon of regular milk, one of the eggs, four cups of sugar, maybe six, four cups of sugar. And I use a really good Madagascar vanilla, heavy vanilla, and then I grind nutmeg over the top. But yeah, it's pretty rich. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sounds, yeah. Sounds but like, like I said, if you don't consume it all, you just What can I say? Yeah. So yeah. Hello, Patty. Share your bowl. Oh, how are you? Is this your yes. comb? Or I can um, have it written so I don't well, know. Well, I could just say that. Is it a lavender comb? You should. Yeah. Did you have a nice Thanksgiving? I think there's a little bit of fruit. Yeah. Thank you. So, you know, my family always gives the idea to come to the event. Yeah. I was there. My daughter was trying to buy it. Oh, I see. You don't do that. Just in egg-free brownie recipe. First of all, there's very, very few people that actually legitimately Seriously. need to be in the city. I mean, hardly I mean, a lot of people, you know, go on it just because it's more of those have had. But, uh, you know, the chefs will tell you, yeah, I'm sorry, you can't make it. It's not going to taste that good. Yeah. You know, you can make it, but it's not going to taste that good. It's the right stuff. It takes a lot of work to learn how to work around those things. Yeah, it does. And this altitude.
I'm not real big on the Ovechinos either. I'd rather go over here to uh, what's your basis? Uh, a pair of jeans. Um, you know, I like those. I like those better. I could, red, green, so you get two of those red, white, gray. It's still not in there. It's, it's, a, it's, you know, I don't think it's quite as good as a pair of jeans, but it's certainly better than white. So it's kind of in between ones. Okay, because we have these here. I like the olive brand. Well, I um, so I'm new to this whole deal. Bob Radosovich, who's on TAC, he retired, and so I wanted to. Uh, we asked for additional funding at the TAC for for the additional money for Douglas Avenue. So I wanted to be here in case any questions were came up or anything like that. So that's the only reason why I'm here. I sure hope so. Yeah, hope so that's excellent. So anyway, yeah, I'm, and. Uh, I might, there's a chance that my office might have me to take over Bob's spot on tax in the future here, so since he retired, well, you, know what we you are, yeah, you are yeah, the community, the community advisor, we, right? We approach things from a, a yep. different right. point of view. Right, and that's, that's another good reason for me to be here, just to see how this all plays out, so I'm real happy. Hey, right, nice to meet you, too. Hope it's entertaining. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Obviously, he won big. Um, I, I certainly like Yeah, I so I've got a lot of 
few pieces yeah, along. Yeah, quietly but <laughs> what did you do for a living? It's always good to be a little bit. Yeah, uh, I am very well Second marriage. So this is, they got like two teenagers. I've heard three or four years we had our own backyard. We didn't have to come on TV. Oh, I buy fresh eggs. I buy fresh eggs. There were some controversies in the past year or so. But management is good. Yeah. You guys are interesting people up there. Well, I would like to see you. Okay, I make it uh, 3 o'clock uh, by the old clock on the wall, and it's time once again for a gathering that we call the Community Advisory Committee. Uh, we'd like to remind you, uh, we do not have Bethany with us today, so please make sure you use your microphones when you are uh, entering thoughts um, uh, on point uh, during the course of the meeting so that they will be captured by the audio system. Uh, we do have a quorum, uh, sufficient warm bodies to, to get through that part. Uh, so we are in place. I'm Jim Moore, um, at-large and chair. Michelle? Michelle Day, at-large. 
Jessica McMullen with PPACG. Julie Ott, League of Women Voters. Sharon Brown, City of Fountain. Patty Apollo, Colorado Springs. Roy Rosenthal, Manitou Springs. Jen Nellinger, El Paso County. Kevin Walker, at large. Tim O'Donnell, Kono. Courtney Stone, Citizen at Large. And we have a visitor who's in. Uh, Jason Dosh, I'm with the Town of Palmer Lake, the Roads Department. Oh, okay. Um, Jason and I were talking in advance, and he's uh, uh, looks like he might become part of the TAC. So, oh, it's, it's possible. Uh, Bob Radosovich retired, and um, it's sounding like that I might be the one that hasn't been officially decided yet. Okay, right? okay. We're a pretty small organization, so they don't have too many choices. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens. That's what happens. Okay, and I saw Aubrey. Aubrey is here, and uh, Tamara is walking in. So we've got a good group today. So thank you, everybody. Um, I have not had a chance before now, I don't think, to express my appreciation to everyone who uh, made it to the uh, ribbon cutting or ribbon breaking by bicycle uh, <laughs> at the uh, uh, interchange at Cimarron and uh, I-25. It was uh, brisk. Mm -hmm. to say the least, mm -hmm. but I thought it came off pretty well, and uh, that is right. quite, uh, quite an a, uh, accomplishment uh, for CDOT. Okay, uh, consent agenda. Uh, does anyone have any comments or want to move anything out of the consent agenda for discussion? Hearing not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. 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 Okay. Uh, wait a minute. Moved by, is it Sharon? Yes. And second by Roy. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Um, public comments? Hearing none, let's move on to our action item. Uh, Miss Jessica, do you want to do it from there? No, I'm going to stand up so I can read the screen and move along with us. So it is the season that we are looking at our CAC nominating committee for 2018 officers. Currently, our current board members, Chair Jim Moore, who has served for one year and is eligible for a second term. First Vice Chair Kevin Walker, who has served for one year and is eligible for a second term. And Second Chair Michelle Day, who is one year, also eligible for a second year. Um, our bylaws specifically call out which, who our officers are and how they are selected. Officers may be nominated by a nominating or membership subcommittee. Um, a nominee shall be presented to the membership for election at the last regularly scheduled meeting of each year. So, what this actually means for practical purposes, because I'm sure all of you have read through all of these details. Um, so what this means, we're establishing the committee. We're looking to find out who would be interested in serving on the nominating committee. You would say, that's me, and then you all would make an action on who was going to establish, not me, me. You would volunteer um, and say, this is the nominating committee. We've already got one person who's been requested to serve on that, um, which is the same part of that process, is to ask people to help coordinate it. Um, individuals on the board who may be interested in serving in a position will contact Bethany and let her know um, by December 11th. Um, then the nominating committee will interview those folks and bring a proposal to the board at our December board meeting. Um, that vote will be taking place in January. Does anyone have any questions about this? Let me first uh, say I asked Jen Mellinger, <laughs> bless her heart, <laughs> after, after some persuasion, she has agreed to chair the committee uh, for nominations. And so, Jen, do you have any thoughts as uh, you've pondered uh, agreeing to do that? Um, I, I, you know, what I'd really like to do is if um, we have a, a diverse group of people on the nominating committee that, that you know, whether you're new or whether you're, you've got some experience, I think because we're looking at establishing leadership, um, those with some experience um, as far as determining what's going to be a good fit 
for our group and what's going to be appropriate for allowing um, people to get some experience in leadership positions. Um, if you're interested in serving on the nominating committee, just go ahead and email me directly, and then uh, we'll work out a time to get together. So. Okay. Okay. And then Bethany. And I would really appreciate it if you. It's it's not going to be dramatic. So um, if if you would if you have time, we'll probably only need one meeting to just send me a quick email. We'll get it set up. Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, let me just add a couple of thoughts. Uh, some of the newer members of the committee uh, don't be reluctant. If uh, if you've had some experience with other boards or other other committees that you've served on and think you've got a perspective to bring to this. Uh, if you're interested, let Jen know. Uh, I would even go so far as to say you could let her know before we leave this afternoon. If, 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 you're, if, if, it just, if it's just kind of a driving impulse that's <laughs> pushing you forward somehow. I'm not sure I want to know if that's the case, but that's all right. Um, Okay, any other questions for Jessica or for Jen or comments? I'm going to add one quick thing. This is listed as an action item on our agenda. Right. So we do need to establish the CAC nominating committee um, for the 2018 officers now. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> All right. Then. That is how the butt. Okay. Great. And I'll, I'll, oh, okay, that would make two minutes. Oh. I would not. Go ahead. <laughs> I can fight over it, Sharon, but I'm going to no, 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 that's all right. So we have Tamara and Courtney. Courtney, Tamara, and we probably need one more. Oh, sure. Great. All right, thank you. And uh, I'll get a hold of you all soon so we can get something together. Okay. okay. Thank so you. So we have our committee. Can I have a motion. motion to approve Jen, Tamara, Sharon, and Courtney as our nominating committee? I move we approve that committee. Do we have a second? second? Second by Kim. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you guys. Volunteers. Okay, are, who is going to brief? Jennifer. Ken is our Jennifer today. Ken is Jennifer today. <laughs> Your hair got really short, Jennifer. I uh, cut my hair. Um, Jim, I think you asked Jennifer for a copy of the scoring criteria that was used on the last plan. Yes. D did she get that distributed to all of you, or? I did not see. All right, it. then let me do that now. We'll and talk, let me explain talk about why, it a, a why I raised that question. Talk about it a little bit later. Uh, in the I meeting. was a little bit concerned that as we were talking about criteria and scoring, that we didn't get ourselves locked into uh, the 2040. Um, criteria or scoring just as a matter of let's pull that forward. We need to we need to make sure that we are selecting something that's going to work uh, as we move into this next phase of the planning. So that was that was my rationale for asking. For okay. That. Okay. I, I think that's a, that's a good point. There are some things that were selected in the past, and then when we actually got the projects in and we looked at it and say, well, that project doesn't fit this scoring criteria so how to or the criteria doesn't fit the project so how can we modify it to make it work and, and I'm sure no matter what we will do we will have a project that will come forward that doesn't fit a category and we will have to uh, work the best we can but that's kind of what we're talking about today this is a discussion item um, the board at its last meeting uh, finally approved the infill target and I think it was identified in your memo in, in the attachment there uh, and so now the, the next step is, is to um, identify what the scoring criteria is for each one of these targets in the past well, and then from there, once the, the board approves the scoring criteria, we'll develop a weighting. We have 10 targets. Which one is most important or all, the, all equally important to our region? Or is safety more important than uh, mobility or vice versa? And so in the past, usually, CAC has developed the weighting because you have a citizen's perspective 
of what's important in our region. Um, and we'll talk about this more in, in, in detail. There are some different ways of doing it. Um, and and what, what we're leading up to is then, you know, if, if we can get the board to approve the criteria in January and then approve the weighting in February, our call for project starts in March. And we want to have all of this out so everybody knows what the rules of the game are, how to write their application so it, they can score the best, how to pick which project, if they've got multiple projects, there's not enough money for all of them. So, okay, which one of my projects will score better? They can self-evaluate and see which project will score better on a regional basis. So that's the intent. So today is to introduce you to how we would, might possibly develop the scoring criteria, what they might be. Uh, and then next month, it would be a recommendation to the board for their January meeting of approval. Uh, in the past, the primary emphasis has been on TAC to develop the scoring criteria and CAC, sometimes CAC and TAC, to develop the weighting. Um, so we can kind of talk about that part later. But just, for right now, I just want to kind of introduce the, the possible scoring criteria, what staff is thinking about. TAC has had some input on this. Um, I'll try to remember to, to share their their comments here, um, and then we'll get some ideas from you as as we go along and factor that into the the, the actual criteria. Now, for those of you who have not been here in in the past, we have a scale and we award points to the projects on each one of these criteria. We had a zero to nine scale. It gave a good spread so that all of the projects weren't just one or two points apart. Uh, a shortcoming in it is that there are some projects that have a negative impact. You can do something for mobility and get people to drive faster. Well, that's bad for the air. But we didn't have a negative scoring to show that, that negative impact. All we had was a zero value. Well, the zero is the same thing as no impact at all, not applicable. So we didn't truly reflect the possibility of, an, of a negative impact. So we're proposing this time to have a scoring criteria of minus nine to plus nine, and we would come back next, next month with, okay, for mobility, here's how you would get minus nine to a plus nine. And for safety, here's how you'd get minus nine to plus nine. Um, And that's kind of our approach this time around. Um, question. No, we won't. We won't have a, a, any any new goals or anything. But like for air quality, uh, air quality from a transportation standpoint primarily comes from emissions. The more you drive, the more vehicle miles you drive your car, the more emissions that you have. So we can have a, a road project that would reduce. The miles, you know, we put them in a bus, a bus route. Put in buses and get people on buses. That takes cars off the road. There's less emissions. That would be positive. The more reduction in emissions, the higher the score. Now, think 45 miles per hour is kind of a, a turning point. Cars are most efficient, at least a few years ago, at about 45 miles per hour. You start going faster than that, your car is less efficient in burning its fuel, produces more emissions. As you go slower than that, you produce more emissions. So if we go out on the interstate and say, speed is too slow on the interstate, let's put in a third lane or another lane, 
and everybody can drive, instead of going 65 miles an hour, they can drive 75 miles an hour on the interstate. Wonderful for mobility. But going from 65 to 75 increases the rate of emissions from every car that drives on it. Bad for air quality, good for mobility. And so we would, from a negative standpoint, we would have this scale and we have to, have to decide yet what, how much negative, how, many, how much new emissions is worth one negative point, how much new emissions is worth a negative nine points. Yes. Since we're talking about air quality as just one example, and, and, and this time around, um, that's under our um, economic uh, environment. It's under our environment. It's been combined into one goal. It used to be three separate goals, so air quality was in itself a, a separate goal and a separate criteria. But we, we could set the scale that if you reduce the, the amount of carbon, we use carbon monoxide because that's what we are in a legal status for. Uh, if, if you reduce the emissions of carbon monoxide um, uh, in the region by 100,000, well, I'll, I'll say 100 tons a day. Say that's worth nine points. Then if you reduce it 90 or 90, you know, would be eight points. 80, 80 tons a day would be seven points. You know, you, we could set up a scale like that. But, but then the same token for the negative side, if you increase carbon monoxide emissions 10 tons a day, you'll get an, a negative point. And if you increase it 100 tons a day because of your project, then we will get, you'll get a negative nine. Now, that score, whatever that score is, plus three, minus seven, whatever, is only one of the 10 scores for that project. Over here under mobility, that project, okay, it jumps, uh, because everybody is driving faster, the total hours of travel will be reduced. So that's how we we'll, could, could measure mobility is the amount of travel time in the region. Okay, that has done wonderful things for mobility. That gets a plus nine. Here's another project that did something for some reason, but because of it, now, regionally, it actually takes a little bit longer to drive. So that's a measure of mobility would, would be, well, that, that's, only a, that's going to get you a negative one for mobility, even though you were good for air quality or, or vice versa. And then you add up all of those 10 scores for the project, and that's its raw score, total raw score, then you apply the weighting where we said that mobility is more important than environment. And so we're going to give the mobility score 
twice as much weight as the environmental score, half as much weight as safety. And then that becomes the total weighted score for each project. So it's the sum of those 10 raw scores weighted by the approved factor. And then that's the total score for the project. And then we, look, we rank the projects by their, their total weighted score and say, here's the highest weighting, here's the lowest weighting. How much money are they asking for? A billion dollars. How much do we have? We've got 500 million. Well, here's the cutoff line right here. These projects made it above the cutoff line. These projects are below. Then there's always some horse trading that people don't want to rely on strictly the computer making decisions for them. So well, my project is only one point below the cutoff line. It is critical for these reasons, and it should be moved up. Well, my project over there is not that critical. I'm willing to let it drop down because it has to be physically constrained. We, can't, we cannot approve more projects than we have money for. I see subjective judgment, and I think this, this scoring system, you're trying to eliminate that, but at the same time, you're still injecting the subjective judgment. What I want to know is, did you test this? Did you test this negative factor to, just to see how it would work and if it comes out so that you can justify using this new negative factor? We have not gotten that far yet. We, we have not developed our... our our, our negative scale. From past experience, I know that when we had a project that increased air emissions, it got a score of zero on a scale of zero to nine. Nine being the best project for the most reductions, one that increased got a zero. A project that did not increase, a planning study, which is a stack of papers that winds up sitting on somebody's shelf, also got a zero. We did not take into account the, the true negative impacts of some of our projects. They do have, they are counterproductive to each other. And, and that's where we have to be honest with what the benefits or the imp negative impacts are. And then what's important to us as, as a region. Well, we will, and that, that's what will be coming back next month. Um, but we, we have to figure out, okay, what's, how do you get one point? How do you get nine points? How do you get a minus one for each one of these goals? And, and that's what staffs will be doing for the next month is to come back to you with that and say, here's, here's what we're proposing. Kevin and then Aubrey. Now I, uh, I, I think I understand the question, but I, I think intuitively it makes sense to me to have something below zero or below the midpoint where there's no impact, whether it's five is no impact and two is a negative impact, or zero is no impact and negative five is a neg or zero is the midpoint and minus five is a negative impact. I, I think it makes sense to have a you know a negative side to a no impact type of thing. So just intuitively, that makes sense to me. I have no clue how that's going to work. I've never done anything like that, but I think 
I think it's kind of an interesting sort of concept. So I'd, I'd agree that maybe a testing, a little testing scenario might actually provide some insight into that. Okay. Aubrey, Michelle, Courtney, I saw Jen first and then Tim. I have to remember <laughs> that now. Okay, Aubrey, you're up. Yeah, just very quickly, I agree with Kevin. I think there needs to be some delineation between a zero impact and a negative impact project. Uh, maybe when you come back with the scoring criteria, with you know how they're, what one means, what negative one means, you could have some example scenarios mm -hmm. in terms of having tested it, and we could sort of see those how it plays out in real life. Yeah, and, and I'm sorry. Go ahead and let everybody. Okay, Michelle. The question I've got is: so we've got a bunch of projects that have been previously scored under old criteria, are we going to rescore everything that's not currently being worked on that kind of fell below the cut line? Because you can't compare the scoring under the old criteria to this criteria. Correct. So we are, we are creating new criteria and we're doing a call for new projects. What's in the current 2040 plan could well be completely out the door. We're calling for new projects. Now, I am sure that some of those projects that are resubmitted will be in the current plan, and they were in the 2035 plan, and they were in the 2020 plan because they've never been funded. Uh, the 20 years, you know, it's a 20-year plan, and we're asking for projects for the next 20 years. We're going to redo a new plan in four years. So obviously, we're not going to get them all done. Some may fall be on, on the wayside because... Elected officials have changed, local entity, city, county directions and priorities have changed. And so they say, well, at that time we wanted that project, but now we don't anymore, so we're not going to resubmit it for the 2045 plan. I just want to make sure we're not going to end up using old criteria and comparing it to whatever new criteria. No, we're, we're using set. the new criteria that, that's going to be developed off of here. Um, for all projects. For all new for all projects, and that's what we'll be scoring. Now, the old criteria you have in, in front of you—that's what was passed out. And there were 13 goals. Air was a goal. Water was a goal. Um, maintenance was a goal. Mobility was a goal. Um, and each one of those had a a scoring criteria. Now we will probably use some of the same criteria. Vehicle miles of travel, vehicle hours of travel, um, accident data, and, and safety reductions from projects. Um, they were good criteria then. If they're still good criteria for these new goals, we, we will still use them. We're not going to go out and try to reinvent the wheel and com to completely ignore these 13 criteria that we've used in the past. But we have some new goals here, so we may have some new criteria. Okay, here, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to let the three people that I've identified ask your questions or make your comments right now. But do you have more? Because there's a lot more in the paper that we were well, I, it, to discuss. You know, do you want to go through that or no? I, that, that, that's up to you. But, but we were just trying to show in there that we've got – the 10 goals, but if you remember, we had, I think it's 18 objectives because several of the goals had two or three objectives, uh, and they, each objective had its own target. Now, if there are, for environment, if there are now three objectives, one for air, water, and critical habitat, if each one of those has a scoring criteria of its own, then that one target now has three questions, three scores. That is going to higher weighting automatically right there than maintenance, which only has one target and one scoring criteria and one score. Would so that's kind of where we have gone, where we've combined the environmental justice targets mm -hmm. into, or environment into one target, into one scoring criteria. Maintenance is one. Mobility is one. Uh, so we're, we're proposing ten criteria. And then it would be the, the, the goals. Um, 
I'm a little concerned about what you just said regarding the fact that, for instance, environment has three targets or, and implying that rather than a single number coming up for environment, the implication I understood was that you were saying there were going to be three numbers coming out of environment, each then applying, say, say the weighting for environment is, is a half multiplying each of those by half and then adding that all up, whereas what I would expect with a single category of environment is that after you evaluate each of those three sub-areas, you have a net value for environment. So let's say that habitat's a two, stormwater's a five, and air quality's um, minus three. You end up with a four for environment, which you then apply the weighting to. Or did I misunderstand what you were? You, you clarified what I meant to say. If that's if that's okay. not what I said, <laughs> we, we do we do not want. If if we're going if if our priorities are these ten goals, then we have to develop a fair weighting system. So the fact that we've got three targets and under environment does not automatically make it three times more important than mobility, which only has, or maintenance, which only has one target. Right, but we'll end up with one number at the end for environment after you net out the three yeah, targets. Yeah, we, we will develop a criteria which is some kind of a combination of benefits or impacts to air, water, and critical habitat. And in, and in that mixture, zero to nine or minus nine to plus nine, there'll be one score for environment. And then we will come up with a weighting. Right, the environment, then, then environment the is the most or the least or the mid okay. mid uh, priority for the region. Okay. So, good clarification, Courtney. So I will kind of agree with the the piece around negative scoring. I think that intuitively makes sense, and I'm looking forward to seeing some more data. So I'll leave that. But I, oops, sorry. Um, but I did want to check it. So. Granted, we have 10 goals, but our scoring criteria, from what I understand, doesn't have to directly just reflect those 10. So why would we not make the scoring criteria reference each of the 18 objectives versus the 10 goals? Why would we not weight the objectives separately instead of trying to combine? I don't know. Yeah, I'm just... Because right now, from what I understand, we're not actually using some of our objectives as scoring criteria. That, that is a possibility. I will just say that we had 13 goals last time. The criticism from the members of the TAC and, and the applicants who had to fill out the applications is that that was too much work. So they wanted to reduce the goals. Actually, the year before, the plan before, we had 18 wanted to get them reduced, went to the board. The board only reduced it to 13. There was a desire to reduce it even further. Uh, and so when we started the process over again for the 2045 plan, we wound up with only 10 goals instead of the 13 goals we had before. But then we wound up with 18 objectives under those 10 goals. So if we go back to one scoring criteria for each objective, then we're back up to 18 right. yeah. uh, things, and we've actually increased everybody's uh, workload. Uh, I don't think at this point uh, TAC would be interested in, in taking that step. So we'll only, in the, in the goal of mobility, we will only be scoring about impacts to auto and freight. We won't be talking about any of the because you don't have an auto and freight target, right? So even though that's an objective, we're not actually scoring based on that at all. At this point, we are still struggling okay. to find <laughs> out how to measure um, uh, the pedestrians. We have no pedestrian data. Um, gotcha. oh, tran yeah, transit, some... and, and the problem with scoring criteria is, is we're not, it, it's not, What's here on the ground today is what's proposed to be in the next 20 years. So how do you? Okay, we're going to build a we're going to build a trail. 
how many people are going to be on that trail in 20 years? That's the problem we have. We don't have any model. We don't have any, any baseline data to say that every one mile of trail in the region has 25 or 250 people or bicycles a day. We just don't have any of that data. So this gets back to the question at the very beginning. Do we have bad criteria? We had some bad criteria last time. In this case, we don't want to propose bad criteria for bicycle and ped. Uh, so until we can come up with something, we're going to monitor it because it's a target and, and we can develop identify some money and, and, and do a counting process in the future where we can say, okay, how many people are on our trails? How do we measure pedestrian traffic? Um, and, and get serious about it. And, and then four years from now, we can come back and look and say, we, no matter what we've done, we can't figure out how to do it within the resources of this region. So unfortunately, we think we're gonna have to step back from a criteria of this nature or an objective or change it to something else that can be measured uh, even in, even by some proxy. And, and that's what Jennifer, Kevin, and I are struggling with right now okay. to get Jen. come back to you next month. Jen? And, and it was a good segue into my problem. Uh, not, and I'm just raising it because I realize this is still a work in progress. Um, I had a hard time finding where volume or density <coughs> impacted um, the goal, uh, if you're looking at a project. And, you know, I, I see the objectives, but I think we ran into this when we were looking at, at the last time at the 2040, and it was because you may think, well, I-25 has had ups and downs as far as maintenance, but one of the things that we all know intuitively is that I-25 is one busy, one busy road. And it happens to be designated an interstate, so that's, that gives us some volume. But what concerns me is how do you measure um, the volume, which which target or which performance measure is that in when you're comparing, okay, what do we all know is a busy road? Uh, you know, like Woodman into Rock Rim in, at 5 o'clock or, you know, some of the, mm -hmm. some of the just busier traffic. How do you measure the volume of traffic and the high density area at the other end of it? How do you measure all the people going to Schriever? How do you, you know, and as Schriever grows, how do you measure that volume? Because unfortunately there's no good mass transit to get mm -hmm. people out there. So I, I'm lo I kept looking in this going, where is that? Yeah. Well, well, volume comes into play. Because um, we know that can at least be measured. Yes, and, and we, we can. We have a, a, a computer program, the travel demand model, that does, we can say here's where people are going to live and work in, in the year 2045. And, and the travel model will then say, okay, here's how many jobs mm -hmm. are at Schriever. Here's how many people live at Schriever. People who are going to work there are going to come from all over the region and they're going to get here. Right. How do they get here? Well, there's Highway 94 and there's Bradley Road coming in from the south and getting on Curtis Road and coming north. And there's a few people that live out in eastern El Paso County that'll come and go west. And the model can show that and it'll predict the volumes on the roads and whether the, the, the road is designed to handle that capacity. So that's where we can use that. But you can, you can make improvements to Highway 94. Let's say you want to widen Highway 94. Well, that's not going to impact only Highway 94. It's going to impact Highway 24 that intersects with it. And instead of other people in El Paso County driving over to get on Highway 24 because they think it's a better road, now 94 is a better road. 
So you will get shifts in the travel patterns out in the county going north-south, getting on to Highway 94. So all of a sudden, you've got fewer people in one area, more people on another road, and the travel model will reflect that. But we will use volume, then becomes part of our congestion, becomes part of our safety criteria, um, transit and bike, you know, and bike ped, uh, where people live, uh, we use for, for bicycle or pedestrian, I think it's a quarter mile radius. So if somebody's proposing a, a new um, trail, we can draw a buffer, quarter mile buffer around that trail and we say, how many people are in this service area of this trail? So, so I understand that, Ken. I understand that you have a model because I knew it existed. Remember when all of a sudden, after all the projects had been uh, graded and restored, everybody goes, oh, wait a minute, we really need to expand I-25. It was a, it was a, it was a latter thought, and all of a sudden it just got jettisoned onto the list, okay. and yeah. the other things fell off. And so what I was trying to do is find that model and that volume in here somewhere. Okay. And that you don't have to answer my question. No, no, I no, just uh, have a concern no, it, that it gets in there, so we don't end up going. I said, you know, after everything's already been scored, where does density and volume and economic impact? Because I was looking at how you how you evaluation criteria for economic impact. Okay, where was that? We don't know that. Economic vitality and freight movement, and I know you're struggling with that. So I'm going economic vitality. Well, if you've got a bazillion people, and I, of course, exaggerate, mm -hmm. that need to go to Shriver, the Air Force Academy, or however many big employers we have in town, how is that measured in economic vitality? Because that's a lot of jobs. So my only concern is that you make sure that that has a hefty, a hefty impact because it's the number of people that live and work here, and it's the same kinds of things that people would do to evaluate whether they're going to bring a company here. Mm -hmm. um, you, you raise an excellent point, and, and, and I agree with you. Uh, we will be putting out in the next month or two a, a map that says if we don't make any improvements over what we have now and what's been promised you know, for the next couple of years. And we put in our population and jobs that we're projecting to the year 2040. Here's the roads that are going to be overcrowded or underused. And so people can see that okay. and hopefully then use that. Oh, look, 94 is going to be overcrowded in, in 20 years. We need to do be something about it. Woodman is Academy, North Carefree. Highway 67 in Woodland Park. Okay. So we want them to use that information in determining what projects they submit to us. Now, your example of I-25, it was never submitted as a project. The gap was never submitted as a project to be considered in our 20-year plan two years ago. Since our plan was approved two years ago. All of a sudden, we discovered that I-25 between Castle Rock and Monument is a problem and needs to be fixed immediately. That was never brought forward in the plan. It wasn't an issue that we evaluated it and said we don't have enough money. It was never identified as, as a potential project. So it came forward, and to be quite Honest, it is a public and political driven project based on a true need. Mm -hmm. now, I'm not saying it's not needed, mm -hmm. but it has come after our competitive give us your application, we'll score it and evaluate it and, and put it into the plan. So that's why a month ago, two months ago now, we had to do an amendment to our plan to put in the I 25 GAP project two years after the fact. I, what I'm hoping is that you keep
keep that in mind. We're looking at those kinds of issues as we evaluate projects. Right. And you know what? If nobody comes forward with a project that we, that you all probably more so than we know, that we know is a problem, then hopefully you guys have a way to brainstorm some of those issues. Mm -hmm. And I think we will we will try to do a, a better job because uh, basically, you know, we've got this competitive project submitted by our local entities, right. and then we've got our board setting our regional priorities more from a very high-level need basis and political basis, and they're kind of two separate processes. So it would be good <laughs> if we could combine them and say, in this 2040 plan, here is our regional priorities. Now, we may not have enough money for six of our seven regional priorities, but at least in the plan, they're, they're identified. Um, so we might try to do that. Your next, your next subject, which is also a discussion or information only about the small area forecast schedule, um, it seems to me you generally some of the thoughts that you're bringing forward um, can be addressed. Because I'm, I'm troubled, I, I'm not troubled. Um, my understanding of the process that we're trying to hold into here is that <coughs> this is dependent upon people coming with projects to us. So now this is, we're trying to develop a screening process or trying to help influence the screening process, sure. that will select the most effective, most productive, most uh, whatever, uh, most efficient projects out there. That does not mean that it is identifying in and of itself the greatest needs in the community, which is your point. Mm -hmm. This is my point. Mm -hmm. How you do that, I think, is a different question. This is not what we're dealing with at the moment. And, and that's something that I think we can talk about in our meetings, and it would be, I believe, an important contribution that we could be making. And I heard that when we had um, Commissioner Steen and some of the other members of the board with us, that we could bring forward ideas for things that are being overlooked, and things that are coming down the pike that um, may, in fact, impact the transportation. Yeah. I think I think you brought Just real quickly, I think this is probably the best tool uh, that you've got given the fuzzy data and crystal ball uh, parameters that you're working under. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, you got to have something, and and this is probably as good as anything. I'm okay with a minus nine, you know, plus nine thing. I do share Jen's concerns with uh, the throw away to the project. I just want to make sure that we don't build into intrinsically into the tool some kind of weighting you know where we you know measure everything the same when in fact it's not all the same so that's my only comment I and, I, and devil's in the details we'll see it later on so you're right and and we learn that every time and, and we're so we're trying to stay away from as much as possible not using the same criteria for multiple goals because then, in fact, there's no difference in, in, in the goals. Uh, we're trying to not have environment have three criteria and somebody else only have one because you're right, there's an intrinsic weighting effect right there. And, and so we will come forward to you with something that is, at this level, as neutral as possible in terms of, of the weighting Im impact. And, and I agree with you on the needs, and, and we are working on it. Uh, we will be identifying and, and getting out to you and, and to the public on our website, you know, graphics that show accident locations and severity, uh, the road roughness index, the IRI that <coughs> Kevin's talked to you about, um, congested roads today, as well as what will be projected in the future if we don't do anything. Um, the bridge conditions, um, it seems like there was one other, that, that we've got region-wide data that we can put out there and say, here's the needs today. Um, now, that doesn't say, 
I mean, we could go, we could say, here's where there are transit routes. For every place there's no transit route, we need transit routes. I mean, but we haven't gotten that kind of a step. But we're trying to figure out, gather the last bit of data from the city, and, and then coming forward. So that might be something that we're, we'll be ready to bring to you, well, I don't know if December, but maybe in the January meeting. But we want to get it out so that the public can see it. Entered local entities can see it and use that to help determine what projects they want to submit. Okay, I'll be I'll be very quick. Um, I, I'm not in favor of the consolidation of these um, objectives. I think we worked. We had a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into those criteria, and I, I think we would just, I would just prefer that we stay with that criteria. We can weight them however they need to be weighted, but I, I think that I would rather go back to the 18 objectives. <laughs> and anytime somebody says it's too much work, it means that it's just harder for somebody to game the system. And I am always worried about these these point systems uh, that that they end up. They just don't, they just, it's like I'm a baseball fan. And you can read all the stat cast stuff that you want, but you also have to pass the eye test. And so somebody has better statistics, but when you watch them play, you know that they're better. And that's why I-25 didn't get on there, because we had this crazy point system, and we have a system by which people I had to identify one of those things, and no one wanted to put it on their list, I-25 on their list, because it would just eat up everything else. And so I'm in favor of the eye test being very important in this. I'd rather go back to the 18. And two of these criteria are not even in those 18. If you note, environmental justice and cost benefit, cost effectiveness, they're not even in there. They had to be added. If I read this correctly, goal independent criteria. Mm -hmm. The formatting okay. in our well, uh, anyway, I'd, I'd just rather go back to what we already have, and that's my two cents. So, I, I will. May, may I comment on environmental justice and uh, ADA? I, I, well, or maybe it's cost benefit. Are, are we're goal independent? It is a federal emphasis that projects be cost effective. We've always used uh, cost effectiveness a, as a criteria. Um, that, that could obviously be up for discussion as to whether we don't care about cost effectiveness. And, but the and, federal and federal government thinks we ought to. I think we probably ought to. So, uh, <laughs> their money. But <laughs> it is their money. Yeah. Uh, but but you know I, I think there there was discussion uh, about attack about ADA, the American Disabilities Act. Uh, we were looking at you know there are a lot of areas in the region that are, do not meet. ADA requirements, uh, so we put that in as an attempt to, to meet that. Our thinking was is that this we would, you know, a project that was going out to knowingly fix a known problem would score better than a project that was going to go out and be built, and no matter what you build, it has to meet current ADA standards. Uh, the comment by the TAC was exactly that. Every project you built must meet ADA standards. So therefore, we shouldn't use it as a criteria because it all has to meet. And yet we've got tons of projects that were built that don't meet ADA standards. Every project is supposed to be safe. Every project is supposed to be environmentally friendly. You, you could make that similar type of an argument for, for many of the goals and, and our criteria. And so that that's part of the discussion that should be considered in our final recommendation. So, I'll, yeah, I'll echo Kevin on the objectives. I So considering, and I think it comes back to how we weight it. We can weight it however we want to, but the fact that we're not going to score a project based on objectives that we defined as important under these goals and that we've picked and chosen, I think, 10, right, objectives out of the these, you know, the 18 total that we had, I'm not, I'm not sure why we chose those targets first off to score off of, because there's a couple that we don't include or have any 
objectives for. So anyway, I just feel like we put a, a effort into creating these objectives, but if we're not going to score on them, how is that in any way impacting transportation decisions? Um, I think, but ultimately, ideally, it'd be great if we came back next week and the scoring criteria that you come up with looks good and kind of defines things in a way that I don't currently have a good, a clear understanding of how this is going to play out. For example, the ADA one, if we don't have a baseline on what existing problems there are, how are you going to prioritize and score based on that? But that's something that we can come to. I did also just want to mention as a point of process that I don't know, we, it seems often that we go back and forth a lot with TAC on some of these more detail-oriented conversations and just as a, a thought process, if there is a way or a possibility of just making sure we're purposeful about trying to avoid some of that back and forth for the purposes of efficiency, whether that's a joint meeting or just getting as many people at both collective meetings as possible, I don't know. Let me, uh, let me try to summarize what I've heard us talking about. Um, there are a lot of ways that we are, could ask the PPACG staff to evaluate the projects that are brought forward. Uh, they are proposing a particular scheme that allows for a fairly broad spread on scoring. If, for example, we take the full range unweighted scores, the full range that is recommended by staff, any given project could score anywhere from minus 90 to plus 90 given these 10 criteria. Because they're, they're, they're talking about assigning scores of minus 9 to plus 9 on each of the criteria. Now, I, when I read over this package, uh, there were two things that jumped out at me. First of all, I think they've done a very good job, me personally, in trying to bring together, if you'll recall, when we discussed the various um, we get bogged down in language. We're not talking about goals tonight. We're talking about the criteria on which the scores will be assigned. But when we talked about, if you go to the back of this package that they sent us, we talked about the fact that there was some overlap, that there were some issues that two or three of the goals, or more to the point, two or three of the objectives were affecting access, accessibility, or two or three of the objectives who are not necessarily under the same of the five goals that the board approved that were affecting were affected by uh, congestion or infill. So what I feel that Jennifer and Ken and the staff has done is they have gone back in and they've tried to say, all right, these are the broader criteria against which we want to score things. They can do, and I think Michelle did a good, good job a few minutes ago in saying, all right, if you're going to have three components under environment, you score each one of those separately. You come up with a collective score that then is what gets assigned <coughs> to a particular project for environment. It isn't just water, it isn't just air, it isn't just um, habitat, but it is something that says this project is going to have X amount of impact positive or negative on the environment. And so you, that's plugged in and that becomes part of it. But it then gives them a broader range of scores than from zero to nine on each criteria. Um, I'm, I'm surprisingly comfortable with, mm -hmm. with what that ha does because whatever we decide is going to be artificial. I use that term advisedly whether it's all 18, which Kevin supports, or it's 10, or it's 27, or some other bureaucratic solution, we still have to come up with something that, in my view, will work better the simpler it is for the staff to make those kinds of decisions and move forward recommendations. To me, the strongest impact that we can have is going to be on the waiting. And what, what how those factors then will play out. And that's ours. If I'm understanding you correctly, TAC doesn't have an input on the way. Well, let me let me answer that try to answer that. In in the past in the past, most of the time it has been CAC that developed the weighting after the board approved the criteria. Last time for the twenty forty plan, 
for those of you who are here, TAC, CAC, and staff all developed their own weighting and the board averaged them. Mm -hmm. Now, my personal feeling, and this is what I told TAC, is that you're the committee that selected to provide the citizen input, citizen perspective in our region, and I think you should be used for that. And I also told the TAC that I'm trying to separate out as much as possible the project applicants from writing and creating the system that's going to select their projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so that, that's my preference. We're changing the government. That, that's, my, <laughs> that, that's my preference, and that's what I told them, and that's what I'm telling you. Um, one, maybe two individuals suggested that we go to the board and ask what's the board preference. To, I guess my concern would be some of the goals we have, like maintenance, you know, and safety. Those are, as citizens, we can kind of understand this road's not in good condition. There's a lot of accidents at this intersection. But the TAC who have their, you know, they're neck deep in this on a daily basis have a better understanding of what does maintenance, the, you know, how much does maintenance and cost maintenance and just really difficulty of maintenance impact our whole system. As a designer, I will tell you, I learned a lot that there was so much involved in maintenance that it completely impacts how a trail is designed or a bridge is designed because that is, if you don't maintain something on a regular basis, it doesn't matter if you spent $100 million because you're going to be spending that again in 20 years. But if you can design something that's maintainable, that $100 million can last you for the 75 years. To me, that's a huge factor that should be considered in the weighting system. So I do, you know, I, I would have to say that as a CAC, we represent one view. TAC has another view, and I do think that some component of the two should be considered in the weighting system. Well, you're right, and that was the comment made by uh, a TAC member, is that every TAC member has an opinion as well. But I could say so does the, the uh, Metro Mobility Committee of all of our uh, handic the handicap, the Specialized Transportation Committee. So does our Air Quality and our Water Quality Committee. Uh, they've all got opinions. So if we're going to open it up outside of CAC to TAC, why didn't we open it up to the other three PPACG advisory committees last time? Why wouldn't we do it this time? Um, but, but you're right. Everybody has a, a, an opinion, and everybody forms their opinion based on the knowledge they have, whether it's very detailed about a particular subject or, or whether whether it's not. So I still don't like people creating their own system. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, Ken, thank you very much. Um, sorry that Jennifer wasn't here to suffer through this. <laughs> well, thank you, Ken. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much I for. I would recommend, please, if you, if you do not take time to look over the additional attachment, please do it because I think it. It brings back together some of the things that we've spent work on over the last three or four months. Um, and uh, I hope we'll kind of refresh some of the ideas that we had when we understood that there was, hey, there's an impact of the same thing on these three different goals. Okay, how do we measure those? That's what staff has been yeah, and, and I appreciate your comments today and, and your different perspectives. That's what we were looking for. And if you've got any others, especially in the next week, uh, this is what we'll be working on um, because in three weeks is the bailout to come back to you. So we need to get working on it and, and get it get it finalized. So please let us know if you think of something else. Okay. Thank you for that. you want to go to small forecast? Sure. We're working on it. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think Jennifer Jennifer wrote uh, a good summary of where we're at and, and where we're pr proposing to go. Um, I'll just, I don't know what I did in the memo. I'll, I'll just say that uh, we, we are uh, 
working with a, a new software program that we haven't used in the past and, and uh, just like we were with our old software program when we first started using it 20, 30 years ago, we were one of the, the uh, pilot agencies in the country using it. Uh, uh, and then it became commercial and then the, the feds took it over, you know, a smaller version of it for freeware for small MPOs. Um, now we're using Urban Sim which has been around for a, a, a number of years, but you know it, it costs you a million dollars a year to uh, gather the data and staff it and run it and, and do everything else. And the company, you know, just last year, um, developed a much smaller, simplified, simplified version on the cloud, on the web that could be run. Uh, and somehow we wound up being the guinea pigs again. So we're working with them, and we're identifying things that we need to do and want done, and they hadn't thought of it or didn't have it developed in time like they said they would. So um, we're, we're getting much later in the game of having the small area forecast done than we had originally anticipated. But I think she's lined out where we want to go and the steps that we, we hope to take now. The other major difference is that uh, in the past, we had either a standing PPACG committee, which no longer exists, or we had a task force, again, made up of local entity staff and, and project applicants. Uh, this time, for our quality control review, we've got, I think it's four regional economists, all independent. They're not working for any of our local entities um, that... Uh, E either at, at the university level or um, private entities um, that will be reviewing the outputs of this model to say, you know, does it, does it look reasonable? Uh, this model <coughs> is, is an economic-based market-driven model, whereas our previous model was more of just a gravity model that att likes attract likes type thing. Um, and so we want to use the regional economist, because this is their business. They, they, they would know if it's reasonable. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I did have one um, question or um, about process, because it looks pretty, de I mean, it looks very specific, detailed, that's fine. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, and this is maybe a, a bad, not bad, or a stressful thing for me, is is the model going to be presented to um, TAC and CAC in April in a presentation? Or will we get a chance to read that? Because I, I, when I read something, I try and then put it together with the presentation, I, you know, I, I come to it with some form of education. Sometimes when it gets presented in here and it says prevent for the last minute outstanding issues, it's not until we leave that I'm going, <laughs> oh. Yeah. So that's what I would ask is that we get the model oh, in advance of the Keep us in control. So we can be prepared to look at the presentation with some, um, some education. Well, before, okay. Ken, before you answer that, I, I have almost the same thought, it's a, or at least it's a parallel thought. And that is, is there a place earlier in the process where CAC or TAC could be participating to have a better comprehension of the direction that we're going with, whatever the final model is going to be? I don't, want to, I don't think I want to see a replication of an exercise we went through early in my affiliation with this where we did a workshop and did a lot of planning about infill and you know, spreading out and all this other stuff. And then after we got finished sharing ideas, the representatives of the actual entities went away and I don't hear anything after that uh, as to what the impact of our input was and what the final outcome was. So uh, you know, this was all looking like we did earlier when we did the work forwards and, mm -hmm. and uh, wrote in on what we thought were the most likely potential futures for our area. 
um, I'm thinking along the same lines that it would be helpful if, if we're hit with a final product and it's kind of like, hey, I hope you all approved it. That isn't the experts have already weighed in on like yeah. out of good thought and input from this group. So, just something to think about. Does make your life more complicated, Kim? Hmm? Oh, this is generous life. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you 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 raise you raise good good points, and in the past we did have a, a task force, and, and we would meet, and and they would see the results, and and they would say this doesn't look reasonable here, and and there got to be some big arguments between the entities as to where they thought growth was going to occur, and why wouldn't it occur in my entity, and why in yours, and uh, it did become a little heated sometimes. Um, we didn't create the task force this time to try to stay away from that. We are still having the local entity planners, the ones that are approving development and not, not uh, review. They're providing us the data. They're providing us the developments, which we never used before. Uh, so we'll see how well we, we turn out, and, and they will get the first stab at it. Uh, and, and then and we, we were looking at the regional economists that, that are looking on a regional, state, national basis of how things are growing and interacting and all that kind of stuff. Um, it does have to go through our committees before it goes to the board. Um, well, can you clarify something? Because I'm, I'm hearing a, a disconnect. You're saying that you're getting four regional economists involved are they involved at step one? Because the only place that they're showing up here is coming back at step four. Yes. And five. That's yeah. Th we have no we have no results at this point. Well, I understand that. So they will um, in step four is, is after we've we've gotten feedback from our local entities that we've got the model looking somewhat realistic from their perspective. That's when we want to go out to the, the regional economist to kind of give their overall independent blessing. Now, for your involvement, and I agree with you, you should have stuff in, in writing before it's a presentation, and that's the first time you've seen a million numbers and you're supposed to comment on them. Mm -hmm. uh, that... It wouldn't be the first time, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, last time should have been the last time. I mean, we should we should not do that to you ever. Uh, I mean, it looks to me kind of like step six is when we should see kind of at that point your your final thoughts on it, so that we have enough information to then review it either well, preferably before our meeting from the way your time, Jennifer's timeline. Was. Well, I'll, I'll had it sometime in, in early April. That would give us enough time to look at it before we meet in April, which I'm guessing, based on this, is that your presentation, because if you're looking at incorporating our feedback, we'd have to give it to you at the April meeting. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll, that's just, just some ideas. Right. Kind of give give you the time, yes. give you the material first. It doesn't have to be given to you at one meeting with an expectation of results later. If we've got it ready, we could email it to you two weeks before a meeting, and even though it shows up, we're going to first discuss it two weeks from now, but but here's a, a preview. Uh, so we'll get it to you as, as early as possible, and I'll talk to Jennifer about that. But, but I certainly support you that you should not be surprised and the first time you see it is at the meeting. Yeah, I have a, just a couple of general comments. One, um, the land use planners for each member entity are not always the, the uh, most informed as to where development and, and activity is going to be occurring over the next few years. They are in most parts, and since I were one, uh, I can tell you that most of the time they are react, reacting to development and they, didn't nev they never saw it coming kind of thing. Um, so that's one. Two, you've got a lot of other planners who are thinking about things like this, and I'm thinking primarily of people like CSU um, and some of the larger water providers 
that might have a little bit of uh, insight into where, where growth and development might be occurring as well. Um, I like the idea of the economic experts. Uh, I, I think that they, they, provide a they provide some thoughtful commentary on that, and they're pretty much aware of kind of what's going on. And the last comment is this is a messy process. So anytime you're trying to avoid messiness or conflict or argument or heated exchanges, uh, don't. Because they only, they only, you might as well get to them sooner rather than later and have them out earlier rather than waiting until you've done a lot of work and you present something and then Fountain gets no, they, they show no growth in Fountain and, and <laughs> Fountain is upset. Uh, just not, not to pick on Fountain. No. <laughs> but but I, I would prefer that, you know, you, you try not to avoid those things. So that's just a general comment because I like the messiness. So. This is the way the world's going to look because uh, people react differently. You you touched on it when you said you were talking about 94 and 24, and if you if you build a better 94, you're going to have an impact on what's going on in 24. Well, but you don't know how much mm -hmm. until people start moving in those directions, and if we start getting much more development out up up 24, that's a whole different bag of worms. To that, to that point um, that Kevin and you just made, and Kim was agreeing, um, regarding input and the messiness, I view it as making stone soup, quite Thank frankly. You. Thank I, I, I would agree that the sooner we get people, people from the various committees working together, hashing out the way, um, the better for the process. And everyone has has an opportunity to have their concerns voiced and considered. To that end, should we not be arranging for a few joint workshops or maybe um, work, um, meetings in between where we're weighing, we're working on specific subcategories? I just, I just look at the calendar, what we're going to cover, and I'm just thinking, it's a tremendous amount of material to cover in this time frame with the way the meetings are currently scheduled. To just trying to give time for the process, if you will. Well, this, this is a case, as, as I said earlier, where the smaller air forecast is delayed much beyond our original timeline. Our goal is to have it done at the, by March at the beginning of uh, the call for projects, again, so people can know where we're projecting future growth so they they know what to address um, I don't know if we will make it but that's the the schedule that that Jennifer has okay. has outlined that's our goal to try to make that so it's available to our local entities thank you for all of your perspectives so Jennifer, okay <laughs> December PAC meeting currently scheduled for the Friday between Christmas and New Year. Wednesday. <laughs> Wednesday. You show up on Friday, Jim. That's good. <laughs> and we took a doodle poll, and thank you for everyone who responded to it. More people are available on the 20th of December than on the 27th of December. Unless there is strong objection, uh, I'm proposing that we reschedule for the 20th of December. Uh, that does mean, uh, however, that I will not be here, which I regret, uh, but I have a connection to the um, And this is going to be an interesting discussion. I can't, I can't be here either. And um, I guess my thinking was, are you expecting us to come forward with the uh, candidates for I think that can be done in writing. Okay. I'm hoping. I'm hoping. I ask Bethany to look into telephone participation. So that may be something that's on the table. We'll see as an option. 
because I was I knew I would be here on the 27th. Yeah. So I and so. Would it be the same time on the 20th at three? Yeah. 20th or 27th, 3 to 5. Okay. Any other thoughts about it? Was it close between the two days? There were about three people different. There was never a reflection. I, I didn't weigh in. And you didn't weigh in. I didn't weigh in. And Jen didn't weigh in. So it sounds like it's almost 50 yeah. And my schedule has changed. I originally voted for the 27th. I can't make the 27th. I can't make the 27th. So I was just wondering how many people actually voted. Do you have the 27th, though? I think we had a total of 13 probably voted on the poll. I'm, I'm seeing you. <laughs> Give the slow technology person. Jim. Jim. I'm sorry. There are at least 13 of us here today. We could just show up, do a show of hands. Today. Who can be here on the 20th of December? Who can be here on the 27th of December? I don't want to. Oh. Okay. Let's do this again and count. <laughs> did you count? Yeah. You did. We had eight folks for the 20th and 10 for the 27th. So it looks like we're sticking to the 27th. I can try to make it the 27th, but I can't guarantee anything. Okay, well, it, I, this, is a, this is a hard time of year, and uh, however we do it. Okay, well, we're back to the 27th. Okay. I'll bring here, and I'll, I'll bring a chair, and a whistle, and a whip. Could, so, is, is there a possibility, is there a possibility of um, uh, having people dial in? Yes. That's so the, that. the people are here, and then the others it can't be, I physically can't be here, but I could dial in. We, we can definitely do the call-in option. We're just still um, reviewing bylaws to see if voting can happen remotely. Um, but even if people can't vote, I think it'd still be very valuable for them to be able to hear the conversation and chime in. Right. Now, there are a couple of these. Yes, and there should be the scoring criteria Discussion. Oh, yay! Please, Lord. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Read all that stuff. You can do it for the yeah. <laughs> Anyone want to do it for the 18th? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so we're, we're the 27th. Okay. Um, and um, Julie, thank you. Now I know how you got elected. <laughs> 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 Thanks. <laughs> she counted the ballot. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, any member announcements? Um, we've already discussed a little bit of the items for the next CAC meeting. Does anybody have any? Oh, we're going to have, uh, since technically the bylaws call for us to actually vote. Bylaws call for us. Present, uh, uh, present the slate and or the, present the nomination and, and actually cast ballots according to the bylaws. Right? Yeah, well, this is the last break. I think so. Yeah. Okay. So we'll be doing that. And um, again, you've got a copy in your packet or online of the schedule, which now it does include the 27th. Um, I would invite you, if you are at all interested in how in your schedule permits, uh, if you want to sit in on a TAC meeting sometime and listen to how the technical, the people that are actually involved in submitting the projects and things like that, I would, I would encourage you to do so. I wouldn't do it as a group of six or eight people, but one or two uh, sitting in to just kind of monitor what's going on. Russ is here trying to learn what we do, so, and he's on the other side of the, the uh, you know, he's on the dark side of the universe. <laughs> uh, that um, he has some feel for uh, the nature of our discussion, and uh, this has been fairly typical of this group. And then looking out into January, um, who knows? Lots of interesting things going on. Uh, if you did not notice in uh, my report from the board meeting, um, because of the change in number of uh, applicants for the executive director position for PPACG, that um, is now.
now kind of moving into, I think their final is supposed to be interviewing a Do they should have met today, right? is the hope. The search committee is interviewing today, um, and we're very much hopeful that the board will get to interview on December 13th. Um, it was that the semi-finalists were not able at that yeah, time. Yeah, it's a bit of a mess. Um, uh, Aubrey. I know I could look this up, but when does the TAC meet? Sorry? I know I could look this up, but when does the TAC meet? Um, the TAC meets on the 3rd. It's the 21st. So, it's the 21st. Okay. Okay. Where, where's that at? Yeah. Where's that at? Here? Okay. 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 Okay.